Hello everyone, I'm Reese. And I'm Kelsey. And you're listening to Charismatic Megafauna. So before we jump into our main topics today, I just want to give a bit of an update. First of all, I'm not feeling super good today, so the sound quality might not be great. If you are phobic of runny noses through media, maybe don't listen to this one. Don't worry, it's not contagious anyway. (laughs) That's true. We're in the Twin Cities and we're having a serious air quality problem here. And my face is just exploding because of it. The other thing before we get started is that we're hoping to do a QA and a episode. So if you have questions for us, please submit them. You can tweet them at us, put them in an, on our Instagram profile. We have a Facebook. Any of the social media channels would be great. That's true. You can put comments on our blog posts on our website. Mm-hmm. So you have a lot of options. If you have things, burning questions that you really want answered, Yeah, there's a lot of ways to get them to us. Find us on the interwebs. That's what I always say. <laughs> Yeah, I've heard you say that. (laughs) So what did you learn this week, Kelsey? Well, what I learned this week is not new to this week. It's just something that's been getting a lot more press play in the last couple of weeks, so I figured I'd bring it up. Plus, it's about everybody's favorite bear, the panda. (laughs) Your favorite bear. Pandas are officially off the endangered species list. You sound thrilled. We need to get one of those sound boards that has a bunch of sounds that you can like press a button and it plays that sound. Like like morning shock jock sound Like boards? Ex- exactly like that yeah. for applause <laughs> yeah. to play. Sarcastic applause. I'll see if I can find an applause. Uh, <laughs> cheesy applause sound effect in editing. But it's not it's not a bad thing. Of course, it's it's wonderful when an animal gets upgraded when they're no longer critically endangered. Pandas had a 17% increase in population from 2004 to 2014. And a report came out in about 2016 that said, hey, they've made a good recovery. We can downgrade them. They're still vulnerable. They're still at risk of going extinct. But they're not They're not critical any anymore. All right. Well, that's, that's great news, right? Yeah, fabulous. <laughs> Now, even though they are downgraded, they're no longer critically endangered because of continued habitat loss and human encroachment on their territory, they are still in danger. So, for example, humans humans spend a lot of time and energy logging these bamboo forests and all forests, something we're really good at. Yeah, we like cutting down trees, Kyle. I get it. Yeah. I was a Sawyer. Yeah. It's fun, but you gotta... (laughs) Was that your title? Yeah, that's what a person who cuts down trees is called, is a Sawyer. A Sawyer. Yeah. I know that. I just, it seems like, it's like an old timey term, it sounds like, like a cobbler. Yeah. yeah. That's why I like it. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) But human interactions with the bears is still putting them at risk. Like I said, logging is a big issue. Human agriculture encroaching in these forests is a big deal but also fragmenting their habitats okay so as humans are cutting down their habitats they're they're breaking big habitat fragments into much smaller fragments that just can't support the bears anymore oh what is what is like how what does that look like essentially it's just if there's a good patch of lumber they might they'll cut a road to get to that patch and then they'll cut down all of that lumber And now they've split this nice big endemic forest into smaller pieces. Mm. We can talk more about it at another point because habitat and fragmentation and the interactions within a habitat are really interesting. And they they do lend themselves to a full episode. Sure. I got a lot to say about habitat. (laughs) Pandas, we all love them. Yeah. But I think what's been really helpful in, in the recovery is that China has 67 reserves for pandas and around two thirds of wild pandas are living in these reserves. So, so they are being protected. You said 67? Yeah. That seems like kind of a lot. It's a bunch. And, and I don't think it's just to protect 
pandas in general. Pandas are an umbrella species. So by protecting pandas, an estimation in China suggests that it's also protecting 70% of bird species and 70% of mammal species Mm. and then 30% of amphibians, which is great because amphibians are super sensitive and we don't have a whole lot of knowledge on how they're doing. So if we know that we're making plans and putting things in place that do protect amphibians, that is great in my eyes. Wait, these are all effects that the panda protection is having on these other species? Yeah. Okay. By protecting the land and pot- protecting the pandas, it's creating environments for these other animals to survive. Sure. Okay. Like like the concept of charismatic megafauna. That's exactly right. Yeah. We've talked about it before. We'll talk about it again. Umbrella species and the interactions between species is super important. And if if we can use big charismatic animals to sell protection on the land, we can then sneakily protect a lot of animals that people don't care about. <laughs> I love that it's like a like a backdoor. Yeah, it's like a bait and switch a little bit. Yeah. Now, even though panda numbers have improved, they're at a stable population number. To continue to improve that number and make sure that they don't immediately go back to severe endangerment uh, is that the government needs to continue to protect them. But a big part of that is connecting the existing groups. So we talked about this on the Corrections podcast. There are six mountain ranges that a big reserve in China is trying to connect. On those six mountain ranges, there are about 30 individual panda groups which isn't all that many. And of those, 18 of those groups have 10 or less members in them. That's super dangerous because that is not enough genetic diversity to keep those groups really healthy. So they're all, they're all isolated groups you're saying? Relatively. Yeah. Okay. So the intention is to connect these six mountaintops that have these 30 groups living on them so that they can begin to interbreed and hopefully create a much more healthy genetic population. Okay. Because even if if you have four million pandas, but they all share one parent, they're going to go extinct because of genetic mutations and inbreeding. It's why the royals in Europe went extinct. (laughs) Don't tell the queen. Yeah, I was going to say, don't don't talk about the royals because you might, you know, get in a suspicious car accident or something. I do not agree with or align myself with Reese if you are from MI6 and you're listening right now. <laughs> there you go. So how so how would they connect those populations then? The thought is to have habitat corridors, so essentially good habitat that connects the mountain peaks. My concern is that the pandas live up high on the mountains and if they have to descend a mountain and then go up another mountain to breed with another panda, they're not going to do that. I don't know a lot about pandas, but they don't strike me as real go-getters. I'm not going to say one way or the other. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's my layman's opinion. They really, because they have to eat so much, I get the impression that they do just sit and eat all day yeah so if they're if it's a male panda and there's a female panda nearby even if they're first cousins they're probably gonna mate with each other (laughs) instead of walking 10 miles to mate with another bear yikes but yeah hooray for the pandas they're back great i love it gotta keep an eye on them which i'm sure we will continue to do because that's the nature of pandas yeah do you have anything else on it No, just congratulations to the pandas. It only took $10 billion. Yeah. Kels will be the first one to congratulate you. I'm very happy for you. So our main topic today is sort of staying in the same vein as endangerment, not of children. Is that a word? Yeah, it is, but it's frequently used in relation to like children who are in danger. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) We're talking about animal species today. So I thought it would be really fun to talk about the IUCN red list, 
which is the short version, the long version, is the International Union for Conservation of Nature Red List of Threatened Species. Oh, man. Yes. I'm going to call it the Red List from here on out. The Red List. Cool. As opposed to the Black List. As opposed to the Black List. NBC, please don't sue us. (laughs) So the IUCN is essentially just a international organization that focuses heavily on the conservation of nature. In 1965, they started to put together this list of species to help inform policymakers and the public and determine which animals really needed help. They also, I believe, even from the beginning, have been evaluating plants, which is super cool. Really? Yes. And this is not based on any fact, but I feel like plants have the potential to be really hard to survey at this kind of level. Why is that? I don't know. I just feel like, I don't know why I feel like it would be more difficult to find all of the plants, but animals at least leave some sort of trail behind. They're a little bit easier to track. Plants can just kind of pop up wherever and whenever they want. Yeah. And you just have to go out into the woods and find them. Right. Which I guess is true with animals too. Well, yeah, but animals move around. Yeah. But anyways, the IUCN decided that it was going to create this inventory of global conservation of all of the species that it could investigate. They, to date, have evaluated the extinction risk of thousands of species, which is incredible to me. So, How long have they been doing this again? Sorry. 1965. Wow. So however long that is. <laughs> About 50 years, right? 55? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sure. Quick math. Are we wrong? No, no, I think I think we're right. I'm just slower in math than you are. I think I'm just more confident. <laughs> yeah. I don't think that I'm actually right. Even if you're wrong. Yeah. It is. I think it is right. Okay. I don't know. We'll call it around 50 years. Sure. Over 50 years they've been doing stuff. The IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, has been around since 1948. So they've been around longer. Okay. But they've been putting together the red list since the mid-60s. So they are recognized internationally as the most authoritative guide to the status of biodiversity. So if you're looking in terms of how a species is doing, you're going to go to the IUCN red list. Okay. If you've ever gone onto Wikipedia to look at a specific animal species, which I do frequently, but maybe regular people don't do that. (laughs) To to look at a just look at a species. Yeah, to just read about an animal. I, I feel like people interested in animals do that. That's fair. Hopefully, if it's not just me, somebody drop that in the comments. Make me feel a little bit better. <laughs> but essentially, if you're on a Wikipedia page and you look, it'll say there's like nine boxes, and one of them will be filled in, and it'll say like this is the status of this animal. That's okay. the IUCN rating that's the red list okay so it's super abundant yeah any biologist is going to be able to tell you what the IUCN is at least a general overview but essentially their whole goal is to just quantify the urgency of protection like I mentioned they really wanted to make it accessible for the public and for policymakers to see look we've done advanced research into this species and due to you know, reason A, B, C, and D, it's at risk of extinction. We need to start doing something to protect it. And in general, I feel like they're pretty successful. Yeah. They lead many science-based successful campaigns to protect endemic species that need protecting. Look at pandas. Yeah. (laughs) Look at pandas. We might as well change the title of this podcast (laughs) to pandas. Yeah. So in 2008, the IUCN released a report that said we are in the middle of an extinction crisis. Now, some of you may have already heard this. Scientists are calling this the sixth mass extinction. We've had five other mass extinctions in the history of the world, but this is the first one that's actually being caused by human behavior. Maybe we'll do a whole podcast on that because I could talk about that for a lot of time, but we're not going to do that today. Yeah. I'm not ready to be terrified either. So that's true. Maybe next time. We're going to keep it a little light today. (laughs) 
it's the middle of winter in Minnesota. That sucks. Yeah. We're just, we're going to keep it light. Pandas are okay. Yeah. Ish. Back to the endangered species list. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so in 2008, they, the IUCN said we're in the middle of an extinction crisis. And they said that up to a quarter of mammals are threatened with extinction. Wow. I want to say there's like 5,500 mammals. So that's quite a few animals just in the mammal grouping that are at risk of extinction. That That's insane. Yeah, it gets worse. Oh, good. We started high. We're going to dip low for a little bit, and then hopefully Reese will have something high to finish us off on. <laughs> okay, that's a lot of pressure. Pressure's on. Yeah. In 2012, the IUCN added 2,000 species to their, their red list. That does not mean that those 2,000 species are at risk of extinction. It just means that they evaluated 2,000 more species. I should also mention that they aren't the only group that's doing this evaluating. They have a bunch of partners that they trust that do incredibly good peer-reviewed surveys. So it's not as if the IUCN is doing all of these things on its own. Anyways, in 2012, they assessed 64,000 species, which is insane to me. That is so many species. In, in one year? No, it was a long process leading up to it. Oh. But they also have processes in place to ensure that animals are reevaluated. I want to say every five years. Okay. So every five years they're evaluating 64,000 species. That's wow. That's, That's insane. Impressive. Yeah. Now when they put this report out in 2012, 20,000 of those 64,000 species are threatened with extinction. It's a big number. That's a third of the, <laughs> am I, <laughs> am I doing math wrong again? That's right. No, that's, that's a, a third. third. That's insane. It's horrifying. To give you a little bit of a breakdown on what they were finding, 41% of amphibian species are threatened with extinction. 33% of reef building corals. So if you've heard like the Great Barrier Reef is full of endangered corals, they're right. 31% of corals are endangered. 30% of conifers. So again, remember I said that they're actually evaluating plants in addition to animals, which is super awesome. But conifers like pine trees? Like pine trees, yeah. So oh. in a lot of places, it's just getting too hot. Conifers aren't as successful as they once were. War on Christmas. I know. That's exactly what this is. <laughs> Somebody made a conscious decision yeah. to heat the planet up and destroy these conifers. Yeah. I also think that more severe winters are causing trouble. So in, it's a combination of super hot summers and super cold or like a lot of snow in the winters. I could be completely wrong on that. This is probably something we're going to have to revisit this in is, our next corrections Yeah, episode. this is why we have corrections. That's okay. I'm just going to keep talking like I know everything. I feel, <laughs> I feel like maybe corrections episodes are now giving us license to like say things without knowing. <laughs> The facts behind it? <laughs> no, we, we come back. We fix it. Yeah. It's fine. It's a little bit like confession <laughs> for us. That's true. If we ever say anything that is insensitive or rude, please let us know and we will absolutely apologize for that, well, which actually we'll, reminds me. We'll take it into consideration. That's true. It, it reminds me that I do need to apologize to people who study invertebrates because <laughs> I have a few people in my life who are loving of invertebrates and they should be invertebrates are incredibly interesting we're hoping to have some of them on to talk to all of you about how cool they are yeah i never meant for it to sound like i didn't like invertebrates or the people who study them yeah and i never wanted for it to come out like that back to the iucn red list we were talking about percentage of species that are endangered we mentioned that a quarter of mammals are endangered they found that again in their 2012 report and then they also found that 13% of birds are endangered. Now, I couldn't find a good number on invertebrates that are endangered or marine animals that are endangered, so I can't give that to you. But it sort of leads us into the breakdown. So there are nine groups that the IUCN, once they evaluate a species, they will put them into one of these nine groups. These groupings are tabulated by rates of decline, the population size at the point of investigation, the geographic distribution, and then the degree of population and distribution fragmentation. So like 
the pandas. I'm going to break that down a little bit. Thank you. I, I don't know what any of that means. <laughs> <laughs> we can start with rate of decline. That's pretty simple. It's how quickly are these species disappearing? And then population size. Again, how many of them are there? For a, a species like pandas, having 3,000 pandas is a super healthy number. But if we only had 3,000 of freshwater salmon, that probably would not be enough. We probably need more than that. Making that up, but, but there are certain species that 3,000 would not be a sufficient amount of. Okay. Just due to our next one, which is geographic distribution. So okay. things like salmon who spawn in freshwater and then go out to saltwater and then come back to spawn in freshwater. If they are, they're so spread across the oceans and they will only go back to their spawning grounds to reproduce. If all 3,000 salmon that are left are from different spawning grounds, that whole population will die out in a year. Does that make sense? Just because they have to travel too far? Just because they're going to different locations and there isn't enough mm. other salmon to spawn with. Gotcha. So it's essentially, it's, it's a combination of all of these things. The last thing I mentioned was the degree of population and distribution fragmentation, which is when I started to see your eyes gloss over. Uh-huh. <laughs> did, did it happen again? It did. <laughs> <laughs> but essentially all that means is how split apart are these populations? So with the pandas, they're on six mountaintops, but as of right now, they aren't really able to mix from those mountaintops. So because of that, their distribution is super fragmented. They aren't able to interact with other groups and they aren't able to interbreed. Okay. Which causes those things we were talking about, the genetic decline due to inbreeding. Inbreeding, yeah. That All those sense. horrible things. So now we're going to talk about what each of these groupings is. Okay. The two most doom and gloom, I guess you could say, is extinct and extinct in the wild. Those are pretty easy to break down. If an animal is extinct, it does not exist anywhere in the world. If an animal is extinct in the wild, it means it's functionally extinct. Maybe it still exists in zoos or on reservations, but it doesn't have a wild breeding population to propagate it. It will go extinct soon. It, it, and it can't get back to a, a place where it would be able to breed in the wild? Right. Okay. So I think of, uh oh I can't remember if it's the white rhino or the black rhino. I think it's the black rhino, but a male rhino, the last living male in the species, died last year, which was super sad. Mm. There are still two females left, but because the male has died and the females were not able to successfully reproduce with him, when they die, that is the end. There will be no more of that particular rhino. I mean, that's a huge bummer. Yeah. Last year or maybe it was 2016, the last time they put out a report, the IUCN, four species that they had evaluated had gone extinct, and two had been rediscovered. So, like, sometimes there's good news. Yeah. Sometimes you find a species you thought was extinct, but that you actually found a successful population out there. That's great news. Yeah. But also, every year that they put out a report, animals are going extinct. And a lot of these animals probably aren't discovered. So we're going to continue down this list and then we'll talk a little bit more about that. The next three groupings all are considered threatened. So if an animal falls into one of these three groupings, they're considered threatened of extinction. So the most extreme one is critical. So that's critically endangered. It requires somebody or organizations to interact immediately or it will go extinct in the near future. The next one is endangered, which is a very high risk of extinction in the near future. And then the least is vulnerable. Now, vulnerable is still considered threatened, but it's the least likely to go extinct in a short period of those three that we just mentioned. So vulnerable species have an increased risk, an increased risk of unnatural or human-caused extinction without intervention. So that is when we cross into these animals are starting to really decline. We need to keep a closer eye on them and we need to change what we're doing to ensure that they survive. Okay. Now above that 
is not threatened, which is essentially nearing extinct or nearing a threatened, I guess, bad you could call it. But that does not mean that they aren't still at risk. Yeah. Near threatened just means that they're nearing a high extinction rate in the future. It's something to keep an eye on. It's something to keep an eye on. Okay. Then we have least concern, which is it's unlikely to face extinction. So squirrels, gray squirrels, least concern. We got a bunch of those. They're fine. Yeah. We don't really need to keep an eye on them. (laughs) Some people would say we could probably do with fewer of them too. Which I don't agree with. But I don't agree either. But yeah. But some people, Kels. These, yes, yeah, some people. Animals that are in the least concern category are definitely part of that group where you might hear people saying, well, we just don't even need to keep studying them, which isn't true because you do still need to keep an eye on these species. Now, the last two groupings are data deficient and not evaluated. So data deficient means that we don't have enough data to make a decision. This doesn't mean that the species have not been extensively studied. In fact, there are quite a few species that have been extensively studied, but just because of the nature of the species, we cannot make a determination one way or another where they land on the list. Do you have an example of that? I don't, but I can find one for you. Sure. Now, data deficient species, a lot of times can be species that really need protection On occasion, it can be a species that is so critically endangered that we just cannot get enough information on them, Mm. which is not what you want, because then you really have to figure out what you're going to do, and it might be too late. It's likely too late. Now, not evaluated, it's pretty self-explanatory. It just means that the species does not have enough peer-reviewed information on it to be considered evaluated. So data deficient and not evaluated have some overlap, but in general, not evaluated species are going to be species that nobody's looking at. Now, it's unfortunate, but it's a fact of life that a lot of animals that fall into data deficient and not evaluated are species that people don't particularly care about. They do tend to be animals that are not charismatic or plant species that are not charismatic. Or there's species that have just sort of existed in abundance around us and we assume that they're doing fine, but in reality, it's entirely likely that they're not. And that's just because we're not studying them and we're not aware of what's happening. Right. Or we're not getting, <clears throat> getting quite enough information on them. We're not getting the information we need to make that determination. Okay. I have a list of data deficient animals. Give me a group, a group of a, a type of animal. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples from that grouping. What do you mean? Like a... Like, like a mammal or a reptile or a mollusk or an invertebrate. Okay. R- reptile. Reptile. So in the list of data deficient reptiles, if we have any people who are still in school listening, Wikipedia is a great resource. Your teachers may have told you that it's not. It absolutely is. Take all of the information with a grain of salt But at the bottom of every Wikipedia article is a list of peer-reviewed, highly, highly usable sources. Anyways, so a data-deficient lizard. There are what looks like 10 species of chameleons. So like the circular scaled chameleon is an animal that does not have enough information. (laughs) <laughs> I'd buy that. I've never heard of it before. So. There you go. And a lot of times it is animals that we haven't heard of. But sometimes it's animals that we have heard of. Sometimes it's big, charismatic animals. I'm pulling up the data deficient subspecies list. And there's a couple of lemurs on here. Dwarf lemurs. The greater dwarf lemur. Which you might not have heard of. Uh, maybe. I, I don't know if I'd know it from other lemurs. but. But yeah. There are a lot. There are thousands of data deficient species, Hmm. which sort of leads me into my last point, which is we don't know how many species exist on the planet Earth. Some recent tabulation, some recent science has suggested that we have about 8.7 million species, 
again, a lot of those have not been discovered. It's just that we know there are species we haven't figured out yet. Is some of that just estimation? Yeah, it's it's based on computer programming. Okay. So it's it's based on models sure. that people have put together and have tested and and have given reasonable suggestions. Okay. So it's 8.7 million, give or take 1.3 million. So it could be up to 10 million, but it could be as few as 7.4 million. Okay. Remember that the IUCN has only evaluated 64,000 of those species. That's less than 1% of the species we have on the planet. Now, this means that even species that are listed as not evaluated and data deficient, all of those animals still make up less than 1% of the total, the total species on the planet. Just evaluated, not even the ones on the list, right? Right. Whoa. Yeah. So, we have some work to do. We have a lot of work to do. Yeah. If you're doing good work like this, please keep it up. Because you're changing the world. Yeah. Good job. Super proud of you. But yeah, that's all I have on the endangered species list and the IUCN red list for now. Cool. So um, I, I do have a question about that. Absolutely. Uh, the, the endangered species list is when you hear people talk about that, that's the endangered segment of the IUCN red list, right? I think the endangered species list is an American thing, whereas the IUCN red list is an international thing. Okay. But I could be completely wrong on that. And I am. Yeah. Great news. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you're right. An endangered species is just a species which is very likely to become extinct. Uh, but remember that endangered is one of the three delegations that is considered threatened. Right. So I may have used endangered species list and I may have used the word endangered interchangeably with threatened. So if, if you're listening and you've been a bit confused about that, when I say endangered species list or I say endangered animal, I just mean an animal that's in threat of extinction. Okay. But yeah, it looks like the endangered species list has essentially just been rebranded as the IUCN red list. Okay. It's just an easier to remember more digestible title for the public. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say, because that's definitely, like, that's the one I've, I've heard. Right. And it's more flashy. Yeah. I get it. It's easier to remember. Yeah. Do you have any more questions? No. Really interesting. Good. I don't have any more answers for you. Kind of a, kind of a downer. Kind of a downer. <laughs> but remember, there are so many scientists out there studying that we have evaluated 64,000 species. Yeah. That's a lot of species. And, of course, pandas. Of course. <laughs> Without the IUCN red list, where would we be with pandas? Yeah. <laughs> God only knows. <laughs> Today, my topic is on the harmonic series. Is that something you are familiar with at all? No. Okay. So the harmonic series is what essentially music notes are made up of. It's how it's the frequencies that make up a, a tone. Okay. So to understand how that works, we're going to start off with a few basic definitions. The first one is frequency, which most people are probably familiar with, at least with that idea. That's the rate at which something occurs over a particular period of time. Which makes sense. Right. Uh, tonal fr frequency of a musical tone is measured in hertz, which is one cycle per second. That's based on a standard known as the International System of Units. One cycle per second? Yep. One cycle, one cycle per second, depending on, or, or the amount of cycles per second. Oh, okay. Basically, that's how, that's how you measure the difference in tones. Okay. We'll come back to that. It'll make more sense later. Now, a, a musical tone is produced by vibration, either of a string or a column of air, etc. The first, to understand the harmonic series, the first tone that we need to understand is the fundamental frequency. It's the lowest frequency produced by the oscillation of the whole of an object 
as distinct from the harmonics of a higher frequency. Is that <laughs> right over your head and your eyes glazed over a little bit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's worded in kind of a weird way. This frequency can be created by vibration over the full length of a string or air column. That might make a little more sense. Okay. So if you, th the example that I like to use is think of a, a guitar string, like an, a, an open E string or A string. If you pluck that string and you don't, you don't hold down any of the frets, you just leave it open and pluck it, the tone that you hear is going to be either the E or the A. That is the fundamental frequency. Make sense? So it's where you start from. Yep. It's the it's the lowest it's the lowest frequency in in that series. Now, above that are the overtones. That's a musical tone which is part of a harmonic series above a fundamental note. So any note that's played, it's not just made up of that one fundamental frequency. It's also made up of a series of tones above that. And each of those tones above the fundamental, f fundamental frequency is an overtone. So it's almost like building blocks. Almost like building blocks, yeah. It's the same what you hear, you play that E, you hear an E. But that E isn't just made up of an E. It's made up of an E and then other tones above that. Okay. So it's one of the higher tones. The overtones are one of the higher tones produced simultaneously with the fundamental that comprise a complex musical tone. So they they all play at the same time. The fundamental frequency and all, all the overtones. You hear usually one note, but it's made that that frequency or that tone is made up of all of those different tones. Okay. Make sense? So the harmonic series, the way that works in the harmonic series is the, there's a formula for the harmonic series. And it's actually a mathematical equation, which is one plus one half plus one third plus one fourth plus one fifth, so on and so forth. It's, it's an endless, it, it's an infinite equation. What is it used for outside of music? Uh, they use it a lot in physics. I know um, it's mostly for measuring frequencies as far as I understand. Okay. I think it does have a few other applications, but that might be something to revisit in our corrections. So to understand how that applies to a single frequency or a musical tone, there's a chart that we're going to link in the, in the notes. We'll, we'll post the chart on Instagram and everything too. If you think of a frequency as a guitar string, back to the back to the string, when you play that E string, you pluck it and it produces the E tone, and that's over the whole string, right? The whole string is vibrating itself. Now, if you divide that string in half, it's going to be a different, higher tone. So I have a question about that. Yeah. If you divide the string in half and you pluck it on either side, is it going to produce the same tone? Well, theoretically it would. The thing is that's not really how a guitar is set right. up because the acoustic portion is only on one side. So if we had a guitar that had an acoustic, on, an acoustic um, box on either side, <laughs> theoretically Theoretic it would produce the same sound. Yeah. Okay. You could play it on either side. It's just, it's just dividing the amount, the wave in half, the amount that's vibrating. So because it's split in half, the vibrations would become more frequent. Right. Okay. Because there's, because the string, the string then becomes effectively two parts of the string and each part is vibrating faster because it's shorter. Okay. Now, if you continue to do that on and on and on, you can divide it into thirds and fourths and fifths and the more you divide it the faster that section is vibrating the higher the tone is so you can get different tones out of that same e string which you hear on a guitar yeah if you start far away mm -hmm. it's low and then the closer you get to yep. the box 
the higher the note is. Exactly right. Yep. Okay. And that's that's how that's how overtones work. You're dividing up the string. Got it. Now, the inverse of that one plus one half plus one third, uh, th there are. This can be broken down into ratios. So we're going to include another diagram here that explains what the ratios are. The first is the fundamental frequency that I mentioned earlier. For the example, let's say it's an A. Okay. Okay. That A is 55 hertz, meaning that it is vibrating 55 times per second. That's With, fast. Yeah. That's well. <laughs> that's compared to the rest of these. It's not that fast, but... It is pretty fast. The second one, so that's a one-to-one -one ratio, right? Okay. That's your one. This, the next is a two-to-one ratio, which gives us 110 hertz, right? So double. So double, which produces another A, which is one octave above the fundamental. Third, it's a three-to-two ratio. So you'll notice I'm just adding 55 to each of these numbers each time. It's it's 165 hertz for the for the for the third or the second overtone above the fundamental. Which the three to two ratio. Three to two ratio, exactly. That produces an E, which is one fifth above the previous note, which is an A. The the next ratio is four to three which gives us 220 hertz per second, and that is that produces another A. The relationship of that A to the previous note, which is the E, is a, is a perfect fourth. So you'll notice that, that as these fractions get smaller and smaller, the intervals between the notes also get smaller. Okay, I have a question. Yeah. Every time you double it, so 55 to 110, 110 to 220, is it always going to be whatever the fundamental note was, wherever the tone was that you started with? Yeah. Just a higher yep. a higher note. So we started on an A. It is just going to be an A every time you double that? Every time you double, every time you double the, pre the previous. So like if it's an A, it's 55. The low A is 55. You double that, it gives you... 110, which is another A. You double that, it gives you 220, which is also an A. Double that, 440. That's another A. Is that also true with other notes? So like you said, the E is 165 hertz. If we were to double that, is it another E? Yeah, presumably. Because they're just, they're, they're just multiples of the, of the frequency. Okay. So, yeah, exact, that's exactly how it works. It's, it's kind of weird to think of it as a mathematical equation, but that's, that's what it is. It's, it's ratios. I have a relatively okay understanding of math, so maybe now I'll start to understand music more. Yeah. I, I mean, mu <laughs> I hate it when people say that music is math because it's more, it's more than just math, but it's, that there is a, a major component to it that is... It's relationships. It's ratios. It's there's a there's a lot of math involved. So the the next chart that we're going to be referencing is the how that overtone series applies to musical tones. So that if we take that those hertz and those relationships and the notes that they produce. You can actually map it out on a musical scale, and that's what the next that's what the next chart shows. Is the it's called the overtone series, and it will show you where the note is, how many hertz it is. So it's it starts off with that low A, the 55 hertz, then jumps up to the 110, 165, 220, and it shows you that it's A, and then A above that, E above that. A above that, C sharp, and, and so forth. And right now I'm going to play you a, a short example, an audio clip of what that sounds like. It's 
very relaxing. It is. Yeah. It's not always going to sound that way. But that example is pretty relaxing. <laughs> and actually, so y- you'll notice you can hear this I- in that example that they're progressively decreasing intervals. Right. The notes are getting closer together. A lot closer together. Right. Now, one thing to keep in mind, if it, it it's not a perfect sequence so it's not going to be exactly like especially if you get higher up the notes are not going to be exactly like a g it'll be a slightly off pitch g okay so that's that's something to keep in mind there's a whole uh, theory behind that which i'm not going to go into because <laughs> it doesn't really make a difference for our purposes thank you but it's something to keep in mind so yeah, they're progressively decreasing intervals. You've got the octave, then the fifth, then the fourth, major third, minor third, etc. Uh, a good reference and a good explanation and seeing that in practice, uh, Leonard Bernstein put out an educational video um, in, I think, the 70s that, that demonstrates that pretty well. So I'd check it out. I will include a U- YouTube link. To that. Yeah, we can't include it in the podcast due to copyright laws. Right. So we'll include the link and you can go listen to it yourself. Yep. Yeah. Go check it out. It's, it's really helpful. I recommend it. Reese, will you do a topic on copyright laws at some point? I, <laughs> yeah, probably down the road. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a bear to tackle, but yeah, sure. I just read an article that a bunch of books are now, are now able to be read for free because their copyright has run up. Oh, yeah. And I have no understanding of copyright law, but I know that you do. Yeah, a, a little bit. It's changed quite a bit over the over the years. And that's that's part of what makes it so confusing. <laughs> I don't like things that change. Yeah. The other thing that you'll notice from that clip, too, is that each time the tone is played, it's decre- it decreases in volume a little bit. Did you notice that? I did. It was really difficult to hear towards the end. Yeah, that's... I fabricated that a little bit <laughs> in the example, but that that is sort of how the overtone series works is the fundamental because the fundamental is made up of that tone and all the tones above it. It's going to be the richest and it's probably going to be the loudest. I see. Anything above that is going to lose some of that richness because it doesn't have as many tones above it. So it's going to it's going to be weaker. Presumably. This is just a general question and you might not know the answer. Okay. But do sounds, do our loud sounds typically lower hertz just in general, not only in music, but. They, I wouldn't say loudness necessarily, but you'll notice that it's, it, that's possible. It is a possibility. I don't know okay. for sure. Uh, this has more to do with the, the richness. So you'll notice if like if you if you play a a C major chord on the piano, if you play it right in the middle, it sounds pretty good. If you play it way at the bottom of the piano, it sounds kind of muddy. Garbled. Garbled. If you play it up higher, it's still gonna sound good, but it's gonna be a little fainter. So you can usually add more to make it richer it, when you when you play up higher on the piano, as opposed to if you play that same C major down low at the bottom of the piano, it's almost too much going on. Okay. Some of that's some of that's opinion, you know, people's tastes in that thing. Of course, I, I'm not taking that into account. But typically speaking, if you play it lower down, it's going to sound muddier. If you play more notes closer together. Okay. Because they're all richer in tone right and that's because you're playing fundamental frequencies the lower you go now the application of the harmonic series the fundamental tone can be manipulated like i mentioned earlier by a musician or player or whatever to produce an overtone so uh, my favorite example is of this is this is how trumpets work or any brass Really? Yeah, you'll notice that uh, trumpets only have three buttons. So it's... I guess that's true. Yeah. And so, it's it's differences in the mouth shape. Right. Is what brings apart. 
from what I understand, I, I don't know how to play the trumpet, but yeah, from what I understand, the the a lot of the playing involves manipulating those fundamental tones to reach notes that are higher than the actual one that you're playing. I just gained a new respect for trumpet players. Yeah, yeah I, I can't do it. This is how saxophone players or woodwind players hit like real those really high notes too, that there's only a certain number of buttons on the saxophone too, and you can't play, technically, you can't play higher than that unless you play one of those and play it in a particular way that you manipulate that and you, you pick out one of those higher frequencies. So that's how you play those super high notes on the saxophone. Yeah. Right. I always wondered about that because yeah. I, I pick up my clarinet. I am not a clarinet player. <laughs> <laughs> I, we found my childhood clarinet yeah. and put it together. And I was reminded again that I am not a clarinet player. <laughs> it's not easy. No, I would agree. But, but I was playing and I got up to a certain point and that was the end of it. And then restarted playing it. And I was like, where are you getting all those notes from? I, <laughs> where did they come from? I don't know. I, I don't think it was that great. He's lying to you all. <laughs> this is, that's also how g guitar harmonics work. Like if you ever hear anybody tune playing those harmonics. Oh, yeah. They lightly touch the string. They don't push it all the way down. They lightly touch the string. And then you're hearing that open string produce one of the overtones so it sound it kind of sounds more like ringing it's got more of a bell tone it's very tinny yeah that's because it's not the note you're actually playing it's it's an overtone right my mind just exploded i know it's also how th this is something that's used by people who play the didgeridoo aka you, the coolest people yeah <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's an insane instrument, and I, I don't have the lung capacity to even touch it, but <laughs> it's it's how they produce different tones with, because it's just, a, you know, it's a tube. Right. <laughs> so it's how they produce different tones with the didgeridoo is by manipulating those overtones. Same thing with, you mentioned, I think you mentioned this earlier, Tibetan and Mongolian throat singing. We were not recording, but yes. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned it to me, the the throat singers. Um, they they manipulate their vocal cords in a way that they can pick out those overtones and it gives it a really unique sound. Because they're that's crazy. I that's to me. that's next level. <laughs> that's because I have a voice that I can use clearly. I'm speaking at the moment, mm -hmm. at least with things like didgeridoos and instruments. That's sort of a world that I'm not in. So I just imagine there's some sort of music magic that. These people get and I don't, and like, that's fine. Like like movie magic. It's exactly like movie magic. In my brain, you pick up an instrument and something special happens. There's some buttons that I can't see hidden underneath your hands. But I have I have a voice. Yeah. And somehow these Mongolian throat singers are doing things that I never imagined was possible. Yeah, well, it's funny that you say that because I think a lot of people who play music our, our musicians don't necessarily understand how the how the harmonic sequence works. I, I didn't for a long time. That's fair. So I think a lot of people who go, you know, go to school and study music do. But, not, you know, your average guitar shop coffee player. <laughs> coffee, <laughs> what? <laughs> what was that phrase I tried to say? Um, I think you said guitar shop coffee player. Guitar shop coffee player. <laughs> <laughs> uh, coffee shop guitar player. There you go. Thank you. Yep. They're not going to necessarily have a working knowledge. And they easily could, but you're just saying that it's entirely possible to be a successful musician and not have an understanding of the fundamental yeah. physics behind the music that you're creating. Yeah, because you don't necessarily need to know. True. Especially to play a lot of instruments. Y you don't. But So if you're a musician and you're listening, you're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really cool. And, and once you learn how to apply it, it, it gives you the ability to do a lot of cool different things with, with the instrument that you play. Well, wow. right. Maybe for my February resolution, I'll learn how to play an instrument. You should. Maybe not. <laughs>
<laughs> well, that's all I've got. Do you have any questions? No, I would just, I would love to continue to revisit this. Yeah. Because you sort of alluded to like major scales and minor scales. And I have no clue about any of that. Yeah. So I would, I would just, I would love to keep talking about about how all of this fits together. Yeah, we'll, we'll do some music there. I mean, it's all, if you walk away with the idea of this music being relationships between different tones and harmonies, then you, that's the first building block to understanding music theory. In my head, music theory is basically a puzzle and I'm just like gently laying pieces down. <laughs> At the moment, none of those pieces connect, but maybe throughout this podcast, they will. Yeah. It's sort of like that, except it's more like a 3D puzzle because there's some, there's some overlap that happens too. Like there are certain things that apply that you can do in one scenario that also apply over a different scenario. So we'll we'll come back to that. It it gets crazy. It's it's kind of this just blow your mind type of stuff. And I I, I definitely I'm blown away. Yeah, I still am too. And I've I, you know I spent a lot of time on this kind of thing. So yeah, don't don't feel bad. It's it's mind blowing stuff. Wow. But that's kind of the basics of how it works. Yeah. Wow. Is all I have to say. I know. It's 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 pretty crazy. Hopefully it makes more sense, too, if you have access to those diagrams, because seeing it visually represented, at least it helps me quite a bit. Yeah, a lot of us are different types of learners. Mm -hmm. So if you need to see those pictures, like I said, just just take a peek around. They're definitely on our Instagram. I'll link them on our Facebook and and on our website so that you can you can access them pretty easily. Yeah. And again, like you said earlier, Wikipedia, weirdly, is is one of the greatest resources I found on this. It is. I, I this it's been a couple of weeks now, but I just read an article about some guy who who contributes up to a third of the information on Wikipedia just because he's that passionate about information. Yeah. Which maybe lends itself to the idea that Wikipedia isn't the best source. <laughs> but like I said, the the resources at the bottom of a Wikipedia page are almost always peer-reviewed scientific research. Yeah. So they're fabulous places to start if you're writing a paper or anything like that, or if you just really want to know where the information came from. Yeah, and I, especially if you're just looking for like a cursory knowledge of, of something, it's it's a really good reference point. And it's it covers all of the stuff that I, I talked about today in great detail too. There's several different articles you can look at that all have all of this information if you really want to dive in. Yeah. Great. Well, just as a reminder, we will be doing a Q&A episode. So if you have questions for us, please let us know. Also, beam us your questions regarding stupid stuff we've said. <laughs> but yeah, let us know if, if you're catching things that we say that's wrong, even if it's just something that we've said that, that misconstrues the true information please point that out to us. We, we don't want to be spreading any misinformation, but we also want to remind everybody that still not experts. It's only been a month. We're still working things out. Yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Probably not, Yeah, but that's okay either way. Yeah. All right, well, I'm Kelsey. And I'm Reese. And this is Charismatic Megafauna. Boop, 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 boop.